Hello, everyone. This is uh, Gilbert Jalad. I'm talking to you here from CPLSPA downtown Orlando uh, with Tufts on Tax, where all your tax troubles uh, answered right here. Uh, if you have any problems with uh, taxes, with employers, with employees, with family, friends, even with the IRS, uh, if you have any problems or any questions, your answers are with Mr. T. Scott Tufts. He's the master and the expert when when it comes to tax law. Now you can call him always at 877-647-7887 or you can email him at stufts at cplspa.com. That's S-T-U-F-T-S at cplspa.com. Hello, Scott. How are you? Hey, good to be with you. Good to be with you, too, as always. And uh, we're coming back with this episode today, a very heavy episode, uh, lots of information, uh, lots of questions. Um, now, first question, I would say, when does taxes become criminal? All right, Gilbert. So in prior episodes, we've helped our audience understand, mm -hmm. like with cryptocurrency or Correct. foreign bank accounts, that there's a yes, no box on a tax return that they're fi filling out and sending in under penalties of perjury. And those yes, no boxes can be of great significance because, for example, um, if you are trading in virtual currency uh, and you answer no on a box and mm -hmm. it should have been a yes, uh, then that can raise the, the specter of possible criminal exposure um, in a given case. Now, mind you, uh, you know, whether a, a criminal matter is pursued is in, is up to the, those who prosecute the, the matter. That's not something us citizens decide. We can file a report or, you know, or go to authorities, but it's up to the authorities to decide, does a matter warrant uh, criminal pursuit, prosecution, and then, you know, and then ultimately uh, go to court or, you know, get a conviction or whatnot? All of that would... It would lead to all that because a yes or a no question on a, on, a, on a form. Yeah, and we've talked, you know, we've looked at all these forms in the in a, uh, last couple mm -hmm. uh, seasons over how there's so much data being gathered. So Correct. it's not a push of the button. There's, you know, a little postcard tax return. Mm -hmm. All of these tax returns have many questions on them that are gathering the data. And then that data is being analyzed by the, and the government has a way of doing that, which is what they must do with a complex tax system. And there's a lot of questions on the... On yeah, the, on these <laughs> forms. But I, I just went to the yes, no, because mm -hmm. those are simple for people to understand. Of course. And also because of that simplicity, they may overlook the importance of that question mm -hmm. and how it's not, it's not worth it to put no if you know it's a yes, right? Yeah. Because as we've talked about, when you do your taxes, you're sharing information with the government and that's confidential between you and the government. Of course. Yeah. All right. So uh, uh, even though it's simple and it's unintentional mistake, it, it will still lead to being criminal well, or well, go to could. court. It could because um, there's always going to be the opportunity to say, I didn't know and I didn't intend. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, it would not be criminal. The mm -hmm. criminal intent deals with um, the government believing they can prove intent, right? Because mm -hmm. intent to commit tax evasion and so forth. But I would just submit to you, no one's going to wave a flag and say, I, you know, didn't intend <laughs> to. So the real question is going to be how obvious it was, uh, these mm -hmm. kinds of things. I mean, do you come in uh, to interfere in this situation? Like, oh, oh yeah. they so made a someone mistake. Someone will come to someone like me. Um, so, so the way that lines of defense mm -hmm. comes is um, they might go to their preparer or their CPA. CPA yeah. should immediately jettison that to a tax lawyer of some kind. Um, I'm mostly on the civil side. Mm -hmm. uh, if it goes criminal, there are criminal tax lawyers who mm -hmm. uh, know what they're doing and need, to, and that needs to happen immediately because nothing that if, if, if criminal investigations underway, mm -hmm. you really must get an attorney immediately. Mm -hmm. Do not speak to anyone because no comment, need to speak with my attorney is the only way to go because once it gets to that point it you know it's so not only a criminal uh, i mean tax lawyer also a criminal lawyer could be, get involved in addition absolutely to, oh, and wow. there are those who are criminal tax lawyers put those specialties together mm -hmm. and uh that's important and, and work together oh, yeah. to resolve so i'll assist on some of this we'll talk about some more complex matters yeah. that, where i come in and assist i see that. here um actually um 
press release here, I mean, a list of things that they announced. And uh, one of them here, a Georgia bar owner pleads guilty to tax invasion. Yeah. So what we're talking about what there is that are, all about? So the Department of Justice wants, especially at tax time, but throughout the year, they want to put press releases out because why that's important is they not only tell the citizens, hey, we are enforcing our tax mm -hmm. laws, but they also say, if you are doing something that's too good to be true or, or uh, something that they're trying to shut down, they need to get the word out so that they can deter. Because after all, criminal law is a deterrence, right? If you know something can get you in trouble, even if you have a criminal mind, you may not act on that mind if you are sufficiently deterred by the consequences of your action or the potential consequences. So in the case of the Department of Justice, they put out these press releases, and this is a time of year to get gets my attention. So every now and then I'll look at the headlines, no mm -hmm. different than we all might look at news stories. Of course, and yeah. so you and I just did that with this, and the top item of a press release is Georgia bar owner pleads guilty to tax evasion. Yeah. And so let's talk about that just as a, you know, we won't go through all of them, but we'll hit just a couple to give folks a sense of when taxes become criminal, right? A good idea. Yeah. So in the Georgia bar owner case, what's significant to me is that you recall, uh, Gilbert, we've talked about single member disregarded entities, you know, LLCs and corporations and kind of how they all uh, might have a K-1 mm -hmm. and all this complexity, right? You recall Correct. that from prior episodes. Well, what happened here that went criminal is that a bar owner had two corporations um, operating bars in two different parts of Georgia. And in operating a bar and restaurant, that's difficult enough, right? Bars and restaurants are not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, but what he did in this uh, situation, the owner, was he came up with a, a scheme to evade, according to the press release, that um, the companies had multiple partners with varying percentages of ownership. But as far as preparing it, the tax return, he told his accountant, uh, you know, according to the write-up, that these were owned by him. So in other words, you have a corporate return that says it's 100% owned by him when in fact he has partners. Now you're starting to think, okay, so that means that when you do the corporate return and you have percentage partners, but you're not reporting that, then all of the income is, is coming to the one owner. Mm -hmm. But there's no connection with those other partners because they're not getting a K-1. Interesting. So they're, they're hmm. You know, right? And if the accountant isn't told, how would they know? Correct. Right? So apparently what they did was uh, he uh, um, avoided the reporting of the distributions of cash made to the other owners. And then they were in on it. They didn't report. So the so the so if you can follow along, what's, what's happening there is if I'm in charge of the income and I hand it to you mm -hmm. and I don't do a tax form to say, here's how much you got, mm -hmm. and I doing that purposely, and I'm understating and I'm lying to my accountant, I can conceal what you're making, I can conceal what I'm making, or understate Good what I'm Lord. making. Yep. Wow. And if you don't tell the accountant, mm -hmm. and the accountant is then... Of course, he has no idea. Exactly. But they'll go to the accountant first, and they'll find out, are you in on it or not? Mm -hmm. You know? So that, I mean, that's a, a big intent <laughs> of criminal sure. right there. I mean, with a big sign, uh, that's uh, obviously they got so like, into it. So we talked about that, you know, the, the analysis isn't just of a entity, it's have you identified the, the owners properly? Mm. And that's something, a big thing, as you know, I'm looking at is how do you know you're an owner? And we, we're going to have that webinar in a little bit. Yeah, you're, uh, you're having that webinar on Friday. Uh, show me your K-1. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. And then we have another one, Gilbert, another headline that uh, I'm just going to read it. It says five tax shelter promoters and two appraisers indicted in a syndicated conservation easement tax scheme. So, wow, complicated, right? So taxes like can be complicated and still lead to criminal exposure. So I think there's an adage out there that if something's complicated or too complicated, the government can't figure it out and it can't possibly then become criminal. Hmm. And that's not true. Even if it's not criminal, but because it's complicated? Well, in other I, words, I'm the confused. idea being that if taxes are so complicated, you can't 
um, maybe form the intent to evade because oh. no one understands it or you don't understand so it. So you made it so difficult to exactly. to, so, to make it vague or, but or exactly. hidden. So if I, but I, I might purposely make it complicated mm -hmm. or deal with a complicated provision of the tax law to then create a scheme. Interesting. All right. So that shows that you're trying to hide something or you're trying to um, have someone, uh, I mean, to slide under the radar. Well, so, so let's take a look at this uh, okay. this tax scheme that they came up with with uh, contribution schemes. Now, you got to get more than one person involved in this. But what they did was they they worked with licensed appraisers and they they had they sold the partnerships that would own land. And then they would have a conservation easement on the land and they would sell it to investors. OK, and, and what they would sell is they would say to the, you know, you want to buy into this partnership. Um, we can create for you a four to one tax deduction ratio, which means that if you pay, if you invest one hundred thousand, we say in return, you're going to get a four hundred thousand dollar write off. I saw your eyes go up. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, I, I can't believe that they, they thought of it that way. And they put marketing materials yeah. that would describe that. And uh, they promoted it. And again, you, you ask yourself, well, how do, how do you carry that off? Yeah. Well, you've got to have some CPAs all preparing the returns properly. Wow. And you've got to have someone appraising it to agree to appraise it at that kind of elevated amount, right? So, I mean, talking about criminal mind. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's just an, there's another one. And apparently in that case and what the, they report on is they were willing to backdate documents and prepare and cause the preparation of fraud, uh, fraudulent tax returns. Um, and, and let me just cover, I think we've, we've mentioned this before. Um, our audience needs to know, you know, backdating versus um, memorializing something that did happen. So when you hear the word backdating, make sure you you understand that there's a pejorative nature to that. Backdating says I'm going to put in, I'm going to claim that something happened on a certain date, and it didn't. So, for example, you and I, um, you know, we get around 2022 and we say, "Oh, Gilbert." Uh, mm -hmm. Back in 2021, we we did a deal and we mark up the document saying we did this and signed it 2021. See, now, on the other hand, if you and I truly shook hands on a deal, we could sign a document today with today's date on it that says effective as of last year when you and I agreed to something. See the difference? Really? Yeah. So it's it's acceptable to reflect on the document that which is true mm -hmm. so us lawyers do that all the time clients come to us and they ask us to memorialize or write up an agreement mm -hmm. describing what they've already agreed upon see that so the agreement Certainly is dated acceptable. today but it's dated but, today but but it will say on it, that on that document that uh, we reached an agreement last year last year on right that and that's date. acceptable because you're not trying to have the document say something it's not okay but if we put on the document, you and I sign it, and we, you and I write, let's write down 2021, you know, just and, and it, it didn't up. happen, and, and mm -hmm. it didn't happen, but we want to do it for some mm -hmm. reason, then that's a that's a no-no. And that's but that's but how good. can you differentiate though? Because on the document itself, us lawyers learn how to write language that says, whereas Gilbert and I met last year and mm -hmm. we had an agreement. Uh, and we put that in the document mm -hmm. and then we, we, on its face says dated today. You see that? I know. But if, if that was not true and we did it and we wrote it that mm -hmm. way, how can that you, would be, that would be a problem if it didn't happen. I'm yeah. saying that in those cases where you're in a current document reflecting mm -hmm. something that previously did happen, mm -hmm. that's acceptable. That's not backdating. Okay, that's memorializing something that did in fact happen. How would they investigate if it didn't happen? Like if it, they, they just, it's, it's a fraud and. Well, usually put a, in the world of transactions, there would be no money exchanged. We would, mm -hmm. in our agreement, did we have some exchange of money mm -hmm. and we're purporting that that happened and yet it didn't exchange then, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, did we form the entity or whatever's going on? Do we have any paperwork mm-hmm. to support what we did? Okay. So did there is something to track oh, yeah. somehow. It's what okay. we call corroborating evidence. You know, okay. Of it. All right. And then we have other examples, uh, Gilbert, on, on this one. This one got caught me. Um, Chicago woman who cashed her deceased grandmother's pension checks. Oh, my God. Convicted on federal fraud and tax charges. And How uh, awful. Yeah. And this is a lady who was a paid tax return preparer. She had already demanded that many of her clients pay her up to 50% of refunds in oh, addition wow. to her preparation fee. Um, and then anyway, according to what's being presented, uh, she the evidence uh, was that after her grandmother died, she continued to take in 33 pension checks, totaling $14,131 oh into six bank accounts over a four-year period. So again, kind of hard to believe. But what I, I kind of find important for our audience is $14,131 over, a, over four a, years. A four years, 33 pension checks. That's not a huge amount of money, right? I mean, so yeah. so we need folks to understand that what they were doing here is they took a paid tax return preparer mm-hmm. who was in the system, and then they realized she was doing all these other things. And they certainly want to make an example of those who are, um, you know, so so sometimes sometimes these amounts can be low, but there's something to be gained by the notoriety of the press release. And they're low to pass by the radar, so they don't, nobody can suspect. Right, but here, but here the, the amounts aren't huge, mm-hmm, but what exactly. was going on was a real problem. But why did it take, I mean, uh, four years and 33 checks? Nobody figured out grandma was had passed away? Uh, poor I, I grandma. Don't <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, oh, God. So, so. You know the main thing, and there are other ones, and I won't I won't go through it. But the government has injunctive powers in the Department of Justice to come in and step in and obviously shut uh, shelters down. And so our audience needs to know that if 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 you see something that's too good to be true, mm-hmm. and it's got a marketing package to it, it's saying we you know we we've got this figured out. We have these uh, opinions that are kind of uh, already packaged up. Mm-hmm. Your warning lights. Sh- should go on, you know, the old TV show, danger, danger, Mr. <laughs> Robinson. That's the kind of thing that should come up, you know? And so we want our audience yeah. to know that get to someone like me that can give you the individual advice on something. In other words, get a second opinion. If you, if you've got Absolutely. some worries, get it looked at and, mm-hmm. and do that in a privileged attorney client uh, discussion. Mm-hmm. All right. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Gilbert to cross into something we've talked about yeah. these these press releases are important because um, if uh, if there are whistleblowers out there that want to know how it works. Um, so if you are a whistleblower with uh, IRS tax matters, um, a lot of times they'll say, well, how do you independently know that taxes have come in? Right. In other words, you you blow the whistle on somebody. You're mm-hmm. sitting around for years wondering what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, there are public demonstrations of the taxes being collected. And one example would be these kind of press releases. Mm. You know, some of these things may have started by a whistleblower way back when. And it turns into this. Right. A criminal investigation or a criminal indictment or whatnot. I Not see. always. You know, it may just stay civil, Mm -hmm. but I want the audience to know that, you know, for you, for the whistleblower situations, um, you may only know about it because of either a press release or, um, you know, potentially lien releases, that kind of thing. Wow. I'm sure we can also continue with this uh, subject, uh, especially I see a a big list of. uh, Yeah. And they come out every month or two of crim of um, uh, press releases. And uh, the government wants uh, folks to understand kind of what's going on. And the other thing is, you know, we have, we've focused and we'll do this on another episode, but I just got wind of um, there's a case called Man Construction and it's out March 4th, 2022. So pretty current. Um, one of our appellate courts in the United States has raised questions about tax shelters that the government hasn't gone through a vetting process. In other words, uh, the government will declare something a transaction of interest or a reportable transaction. What that means is 
just like this conservation mm -hmm. easement or whatever, if you do certain transactions and it has certain features to it, the government demands under price of huge penalty for you to disclose in advance that you're in that you've done that transaction using forms like 8886. Um, they will they publicize those and then what they want is they want you to tell them in advance on your tax return that you've done that kind of transaction and then they want to look at it right doesn't mean that it's necessarily not going to work mm -hmm. but they want to know about it and if you don't disclose it using this form kind of like red flag it then you can pay a ten thousand dollar fine mm -hmm. all right so but what, what the man construction case coming out of the Sixth Circuit is going to give us a little pause is that the government has to go through a vetting process when they declare these transactions, uh, a, a reportable transaction. They have to go through certain steps to give public comment on them and so forth. And if they don't do that, then the penalties may not apply. So our audience needs to know if you've got an 8886 issue, a tax shelter um, you know, and, and there's some question which one or which type it is, um, let us know, get to somebody like myself so that we can, um, make sure that the penalty is not being, you know, is, is one that can be challenged, right? Because for a, a reason like that. Absolutely. Okay. You heard him folks. You can call Mr. T. Scott Tufts at 877-647-7887. Again, that number is 877-647-7887. If you're watching our YouTube channel, you will have it on the screen in the bottom. Uh, you can email him also at stufts at cplspa.com. Again, that's stufts at cplspa.com. You can visit our website and check his profile and his uh, bio and all the information that he has on the website uh, if you go to cplspa.com thank you for watching and for listening and we'll come back to you next time with a new episode more information and more answers about taxes thank you